Members, the proposed expenditure, it now being five o'clock before the Federation Chamber, is for the defence portfolio, $27,211,110,000. So the question is that the proposed expenditure be agreed to. The Assistant Minister for Defence. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Very pleased to have this opportunity to address the House and spell out precisely what this government is doing to repair the extraordinary damage done to the defence budget over the last six wretched years the Labor Party was in power. The responsibility to repair the damage wrought by those opposite has fallen once again to this side of the House, as it has so many times in the past. History does indeed repeat. Uh, wise words to the member for Bass. Uh, the Labor government under Whitlam, under Hawke, under Keating all saw cuts in defence. Cutting defence is in their DNA. In fact, in the 13 budgets between 82 and 83 and 95 96, Labor cut defence spending by 8.9 per cent in real terms. That's why, in opposition, we produced a book, the little book of Labor's defence backflips, that went through in extraordinary and excruciating details all the things Labor cut. The reality, the brutal reality of the hollow fourth bequeathed by successive Labor governments, Rudd, Gillard, ooh, Rudd again, laid bare time after time over time. It laid bare from the end of the Hawke-Keating era, which we saw in Timor in 1999. It's laid bare now. Some say history doesn't repeat itself. I guarantee you, when it comes to defence and Labor's mismanagement, it repeats itself time and time and time again. Labor's custodian of defence over the last six years is nothing less than scandalous. As the proportion of GDP, and let this hang around their necks as a mark of their shame, defence expenditure fell as a proportion of GDP to 1.56 per cent. Not seen since 1938. Not seen since 1938. That's that is what hangs over the head in abject shame over the Labor Party. That's what will be written on their political epitaph, etched in stone as to how the Labor Party considers the defence force. 1938. All in all, all in all, Labor cut $25 billion. That's right, $25 billion for the defence budget, including $5.5 billion alone in 12-13. This was the single largest decrease in defence expenditure, a decrease of 10.5 per cent since the end of the Korean War. These are facts. It's not conjecture. It's not argument. These are statements of fact. And when Labor left office, I think Mark Thompson of Aspie said it best when he was quoted in The Age on the 14th of May, and he said, I was on the record saying that the budget Labor gave in 2012 left things in an unsustainable mess. This is Mark Thompson, widely seen across the nation as the best commentator on defence budgets, where the entire national community waits until he produces his thesis on the defence budget to understand exactly the impacts of it, and he quotes Labor's budgeting as an unsustainable mess. Again, on the 30th of May this year, he said, and I'll quote again, Defence has been under financial pressure for the last few years because of cuts made by the Rudd and Gillard government in a futile attempt to get back into surplus. So that is the frank assessment of probably the most respected commentator for defence financial matters, Mark Thompson of Aspie, someone who's held in high regard, someone who tells it as it is. Be under no illusion, the damage inflicted by Labor will take years and years and years to fix. We promised before the election we'd take the budget back to 2 per cent of GDP uh, within a decade. The problem is when the Howard government lost government in 2007, the defence budget was, give or take, near enough to 2 per cent. It's six wretched years to destroy it, ten long years ahead to put it back again. So the 2014-15 budget, this government is providing $29.2 billion to defence and $122.7 billion over the Ford estimates. It's $9 million more than Labor provided. The funding includes $436.8 million in 14-15 and $669.4 million across the Ford estimates for the continuation of operations in the Middle East. 
enhancing border protection and operation resolute and support to the G20. We have delivered on our commitments taken to the election, every one of them. A commendable start to getting back to 2 per cent of GDP. The ADF gap year has started, ADF free housing has started, and we have indexed DFRDB, of which I'll have more to say. We have, in the first year, put all of our commitments into play, are a stark contrast to the years of Labor. I call the member for Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, Assistant Minister for his uh, opening remarks. And I, I do have a question for the Assistant Minister, but um, a little bit of context first, I suppose. I'd, I'd first like to put on the record my thanks for the wonderful work that the men and women of our ADF do yeah. in, in securing yeah. the defence of this nation yes. in, in a variety of theatres around the world, but also here on shore, and I think they do a tremendous, tremendous job. And in light of that, it's, it is sad, as, as the Assistant Minister for Defence has touched on, to see that degradation of funding and capability for our Defence Force over the past six years. So could the Minister please, um, given Labor's failed history of uh, budgetary decisions in relation to defence, please explain in how releasing a 10-year capability review for our defence forces is going to help build and restore not only the confidence of the Australian people in our defence forces, but more importantly the confidence of the serving men and women in their capability to carry out their duty and the capability of defence to do what it needs to do to protect this nation and help others around the world as we do in many strategic partnerships. I call the minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Ford for his question. He's a man who understands the impacts of budgetary needs and someone who works very hard in his electorate uh, to ensure that his people are well served uh, and those that serve our country and have served in the past our veteran community are well taken care of. The member for Ford is someone who campaigned relentlessly to see DFRDB indexed in the appropriate and proper manner all of which has been done, and of course that indexation starts in 13 days. And I thank the member for Ford for his continuing advocacy. He rightly asked the question about Labor's failure when it comes to projects, and the failure is extreme. See, cutting $25 billion in the budget has to be cut from somewhere. In the defence scheme of things, you normally have a third of your operating cost for personnel, uh, a third for the day-to-day -day operations, and a third in terms of future capability. Under Labor's cuts, future capability dropped down to below 20 per cent, something like 18 to 19 per cent of the budget. And they cancelled, deferred or delayed over 100 projects. A hundred. It is the biggest cutback in projects we've seen in the modern age. Let's look at the projects cancelled. ADF Joint Command Support Environment, Operational Imagery and Geospatial Support, the Identity Management, Joint Non-Lethal Capability, Replacement for Air Targets, Combat identification for land forces, long range persistent subsurface detection capabilities. Let's look at projects they actually delayed. C130J infrared countermeasures. Yeah, that's something you want to delay while we were at war. That's a cracker. Uh, fixed base defence air traffic management systems, lead in fighter capabilities. Oh, subsequent phases to improvise explosive devices. That's something you want to delay. Tier 2 unmanned aerial vehicles, because we're only running those in Afghanistan. Joint intelligence support, the capability alignment for the CH-47 Chinooks, and the list goes on and on and on, page after page. Night fighting equipment replacement project delayed by Labor. Future artillery ammunition delayed. Soldier enhancement version two lethality. That's something we'd like to see delayed, isn't it? Really, the lethality of what our soldiers actually use. The list goes on. It goes to pages and pages of what has been delayed by the Labor Party. Well, this side, the Liberal National Parties, are committed to ensuring that our men and women have the finest gear available when they need it. We are not going to cut over 100 projects of defence capability like Labor did. Labor, who put together a Force 2030, which is a force structure that would be delivered and fully capable by 2030, uh, we aren't going to cut it and gut it like they did and push it out into the, the force never, never. We will work closely to ensure it's done. Under the Howard government, jobs in defence industry doubled. Under this last wretched government, jobs disappeared by 10 per cent. As the economy grew, jobs disappeared by 10 per cent. Industry has sustained havoc under Labor, and it is a shock. 
Under Labor, defence industry was denied the ability to undertake long-term planning because the defence capability planning under, under them uh, wasn't worth the paper it was on. Even when they released the 2013 defence white paper, they didn't approve another defence capability plan. It was not approved. They were too embarrassed. They spent money from it, but the Minister for Defence never approved it. Never. If that, if that is complete and utter disregard. A forced structure of you comes with the white paper. That is the process. What we had was a 2013 white paper. No forced structure of you, no planning for industry, no capability planning at all. But then again, what do you expect from a minister like Minister Smith? Never once went to a graduation at RMC Duntrude. Not once. Not once. Three or four years, three years defence minister, didn't turn up once. Never turned up to a graduation at the Australian Defence Forces Academy. Never. Never spoke to Com Joint Services Command St and Staff College. Never spoke to them at all. Went to Russell three times. Three times the defence minister the went. But then again, under Labor, there were three defence ministers, and in total ministerial team for defence, there were 15 reshuffles. I think the best, of course, was Senator Carr, who was the Minister for Defence Procurement for less than 15 weeks. That's how Labor treated defence. That's how they treated the defence planning. That's how they treated the defence capability planning. That's how they treated defence industry with contempt. I call them. That's, I didn't see you stand up then. I apologise. I call the member. Can I? I assumed that the civilities of combat would survive uh, first contact. Um, Minister, I was looking forward to your hyperbole this afternoon and you have not disappointed. But I might now try and bring you onto something uh, that uh, finds you wandering into the realm of fact and reality. Uh, and let us begin with shipbuilding. You will recall, I'm sure you'll recall with stark clarity, uh, a number of commitments that were made by the coalition in opposition. Uh, and in particular, can I refer you to two. Um, the first is uh, that most succinctly uh, uh, articulated by David Johnson in a press conference of the 8th of May 2013, where he said, we will deliver those submarines from right here at ASC in South Australia. The coalition today is committed to building 12 new submarines here in Adelaide. So I think it's fair to say that the coalition went to the last election with a policy that was very clear. Um, that you were going to build 12 submarines in Adelaide at ASC. And of course, uh, and I'll ignore the interjections, but they do insofar as he, he, he means to help. And that is that um, at that point in time, uh, the opposition clearly was in lockstep with government about the option being um, an either an Australian design or a Son of Collins design built in Adelaide. As you are well aware, the submarine capability is one that of enormous importance to this country and an in integral part of the maritime strategy that underpins uh, certainly White Paper 2009, White Paper 2013, and I'd hazard a guess, uh, and I hazard a guess, your White Paper uh, in uh, due, I think, in April of next year. So, my, so I would like to hear from you on the question of 12 new submarines. Uh, because the clarity with which you went to the last election has, of course, um, disappeared into a miasma of fog since you have won office. Since, since you've been in office, um, that, that clarity has been lost, and instead we have found uh, the Minister for Defence making a number of contradictory remarks. He has, of course, uh, attended recently an ASPE conference on the nation's submarine capability, and at that conference, it where it was much heralded that he was going to make some significant announcements in this space, and of course then proceeded to say very little. But he did, of course, canvass the notion that in fact uh, Australia would pursue a MOTS design. And he in fact spoke about Spain, France uh, and uh, Germany. Uh, in that speech and talked about a MOTS design and those also being options that were before government. So what is the status of governments searching for a MOTS design, uh, in particular from those three nations? Then in more recent days uh, and in the aftermath of the 2 plus 2 dialogue with Japan, we've seen the Minister for Defence starting to talk about working with the Japanese uh, in a collaborative way um, to, to build an enhanced submarine capability in collaboration with Japan. 
as the minister would be aware, but of course no doubt something you don't want to talk about. These were productive conversations that we had had with the Japanese in government, and we welcome the fact that those discussions are continuing. But in, the, in reporting on those discussions, uh, the minister has alluded to the fact that there would be technology transfer. He's spoken of uh, propulsion systems and other systems. But there has also been canvassed the idea that we would, in fact, buy a BOTS design from Japan. Um, there are a lot of obvious challenges with that. But can the minister please uh, advise the parliament what is the government's intention with respect to the Soryu class uh, submarines from Japan? Can you rule out? Um, the fact that uh, we would not be purchasing a MOTS design from Japan. On the bigger question of shipbuilding, of course, there was a commitment from the opposition, uh, the then opposition, now government, uh, that, you would that you would deliver a plan to bridge the valley of death. In fact, the Minister for Defence announced that by April of this year, you will have a plan to bridge the valley of death. He has at various moments canvassed the idea of building a fourth air warfare destroyer, but in office has ruled that out. He has at various moments canvassed the idea of replacement Armadales, but again, we have no concrete uh, example or uh, well, decision. Uh, and then in more recent days, he described as an exciting announcement the announcement that the two replacement oilers would be wholly uh, built overseas in one of either Korea or Spain, uh, and that local, building uh, local shipyards were to be excluded from the opportunity to bid for that work. He has denigrated the shipbuilding industry. He has said that the shipbuilding industry in this country is not capable of building those vessels, does not have the capacity to build those vessels. Can you please advise uh, us how it is um, that that commitment has come to nothing, to ash? How is it you're going to bridge the valley of death? I call the minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, this is hilarious from the Labor Party, isn't it? Leave a complete disaster and then question why we haven't fixed it. I can see the Labor Party. It's like coming home and your flatmate has trashed the house, blind drunk on the sofa. You walk in, start to clean up the mess, and then the drunkard rolls into his own vomit on the floor, wakes up, gets cross at you for cleaning the house and wants to know why it hasn't been done. Well, thank you very much, member for Batman. Let's go through each of your claims one by one to unpack the hilarity of them all. Let us look at the fog that you talk about. In 2009, Labor made a commitment to 12 submarines with an op interim operating capability of 2526. If it, if it had actually stuck to the plan, there'd be no need to extend Collins. But what did Labor do? Nothing. Nothing. In fact, they did nothing for four and a half years. Four years, and because of this, Labor was forced to move the initial operating capability by four years to 2029-30. It also took about 20 billion bucks out during the same time. That's your commitment wrong. That is Labor's commitment to 12 submarines. Now, our focus is actually getting the right capability for Navy, determining how many boats we require at sea to undertake the task set by government and, consequently, how many boats we need in total. We will deliver an affordable, deliverable white paper. Labor's Legacy 2009 white paper, completely unaffordable, one and a half pages of scant financial detail, pie in the sky. The 2013 white paper, no force structure review, no defence capability plan attached to it, no funding attached to it. We will take national security seriously. Labor Party speaks from a legacy where Prime Minister Gillard sent her bodyguard to meetings of the National Security Committee of Cabinet. The idea that would be lectured by the Labor Party on national security is simply hilarious. We'll ensure Australia has the military capabilities to deter threats and to project forts in our neighbourhood. We'll actually do the hard work that Labor has delayed. Labor speaks about Oh, we were the ones that entertained initial discussions with the Japanese in terms of submarine technology. Really, I think Minister Johnson was the very first defence minister actually to go to Japan and start a conversation seriously about what cooperation could we possibly do. Labor made a commitment with little data to back it up and then did nothing and created an operational gap. We will fix it up. Like we do with everything Labor does in defence, we will clean up the mess that the drunkards have made while they still look hungover on the couch. 
When it comes to shipbuilding uh, and the valley of death, can I say this is hilarious? What did Labor do in government? In fact, your last election commitment for defence— no, I won't take the question, Member for Batman, so resume your seat. What did Labor do whilst in government? Uh, sorry, whilst, whilst at election? What did Labor do? They promised to move Fleet Based East to Brisbane. That, that was your policy. The Minister will resume his seat on a point of order. Yes, thank you. It goes to relevance. Um, my questions are obviously very clearly confined around two commitments of the coalition, those pertaining to bridging the Valley of Death and 12 submarines. Uh, he has not wandered near the question. Okay. Um, can I remind everyone present here today that this is not question time. It's consideration in detail, and the only requirement is the speaker's— excuse me. The only requirement is that the speakers are relevant to the portfolio. The Thank minister you, has the call. Labor's contribution to the 2013 election was to move Fleet Based East to Brisbane, and now Labor wants us to take them seriously. Labor asked the nation to take them seriously. Labor asked their shadow defence minister, Senator Conroy, who thought he would use a movie, A Few Good Men, to attack one of our most distinguished generals. You want us to take you seriously. What did Labor do for two or three years, knowing full well the valley of death was coming in terms of shipbuilding? Nothing. We know the success and serious need to be replaced. What decisions did the Labor government make? None. None at all, and now they have the hide, the temerity, the blatant effrontery to walk in and to demand whilst we're cleaning up the house after their drunken party and they lie hung over on the couch why we aren't doing more. Hilarious. I call the member for Bass. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, uh, I've heard you say often that defence is a strategic portfolio and that. Like any good strategic portfolio, it craves certainty and reliability from government. And you've mentioned uh, during some of your answers uh, the 2009 white paper, which, as I understood the process, was meant to provide that reliability and certainty to the Department of Defence. If I understand the logic of the 2009 white paper, it was founded on a grand bargain between Defence and the Department, a grand bargain which had two parties to this bargain. On the government's side, we were going to provide 3 per cent growth in real terms to defence from 2009, the time of the white paper, to 2017-18, that from that point on, 2017-18 to 2030, which was the name of the white paper, it was going to be 2.2 per cent growth in real terms. I think the benevolent government of the day even promised some certainty with respect to indexation of uh, the money it was going to provide defence. So that was what the government promised to do, to deliver that certainty and that reliability. On the defence side, they demanded on the department that it search deeply within its organisation and find $20 billion in internal savings. And when you put the two elements of that grand bargain together, that was meant to deliver the capability requirements of Force 2030. Now, Minister, you would know uh, whether or not the parties Met that, um, uh, met that grand bargain, whether they, they performed their parts of that grand bargain, because I imagine the long-term planning and long-term funding defence requires to fund some of these capabilities would be very apparent in the incoming government briefs and your analysis of the budgetary impact of what happened in 2009 and what happened in the intervening period, where I understand defence was used as something as, as an ATM and that things pushed off to, uh, were pushed off to the right. So I'm interested in your perspective on did the parties meet their responsibilities under that grand bargain and what is our approach in relation to providing that certainty and reliability that defence quite rightly demands? I call the minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Bass for his cogent questions. I acknowledge his great interest in over 32 years of service, someone who finished as a head of IPDiv in a FAS and department, someone who knows a thing or two about budgets and how defence works. One of the reasons we produced the little book of Labor's defence backflips was to ensure that the truth and the facts would always be cogent. And it's interesting to see over the years in the defence budget, what did our commentariat say? Ross Babbage, little security in defence budget. Is he doing the right thing? Brendan Nicholson. No, Brendan Nicholson. Cuts prove fatal to defence plans. Greg Sheridan, our forces reduced to impotence. 
David Rowe, Sydney Morning Herald, defence plans 33 billion shortfall. Financial review, no excuses for mess of defence policy. Cameron Stewart, defence white paper goes down in flames. John Kerrin, defence cuts a threat to US alliance. And on and on and on it goes. It's a woeful story unpacked by the nation's defence journalists. It's a story of a defence budget handed over at the time of 2007 of the Howard government loss in fine working order. A defence force that was committed in combat operations that had learned lessons from previous deleterious effective Labor governments leading into East Timor in 1999. It's a, a defence force in 2007 that was left with the legacy. In 1999, you know you go to war with the gear you got, and in 1999 we didn't have the gear we needed. And the coalition vowed that that wouldn't happen again. The problem we face now is we don't have the gear we need. The grand bargain of Labor providing 3 per cent of, uh, or 3 per cent real increase for defence budget 17 18, uh, and then a modicum less than that out to the out years to deliver force 2030 uh, was not delivered, was not followed through. The bargain was broken in a horrendous fashion. The budget driven down to 1938 levels in GDP terms. Uh, almost 120 projects delayed, pushed to the never never or gotten rid of. That is the situation as a statement of fact. That was the level of debilitating impact that we had in terms of the defence budget. That's what we have to deal with. $25 billion taken out. It'll take 10 years to get that money back. It's a good start, this budget. Over $29 billion, we've taken the spend of proportion of GDP back to 1.8 per cent from where it was at 1.56 per cent. And I never saw the member for Batman out there saying what the Labor government has done is dreadful. Never saw it. Never saw the Senator Conroy, the current Shadow Defence Minister, out there saying this is dreadful. Never saw it. Silence is acquiescence. We can naturally assume from the member for Batman, Senator Conroy, the other shadow team, the member for Canberra, Ms Brodman, that their silence means they agreed with defence being used as an ATM, money being ripped out. The hilarious thing was, was that Minister Smith would often say, oh, but there's no impact on capability. 46 per cent of all projects, which is future capability, future force structure, delayed, deferred or cut, but there's nothing to see here. There's no impact on capability. It is simply and utterly laughable. We will start the hard yards of getting it back in order. This budget has started that process. The defence white paper will deliver next year will be ruthlessly costed, ruthlessly budgeted. What we say we can afford, you'll be able to see where the money is coming from. You can't speak strategy without speaking dollars and cents. The problem with the last Labor government is they would speak grand strategy, grand moving hands, couldn't back it up, refused to back it up with dollars and cents. The, the, the last budget of Labor, uh, they gave capability from 9am to 12am, three hours, to rip a billion dollars out of the budget so their Ford estimates would have a surplus. Gave Defence three hours to pull a billion dollars out so that their budget would have a surplus. 500 times the Prime Minister and the Treasurer said that the surplus would be delivered, and what we left? A $51 billion deficit. That's the legacy of Labor. I call the member for Batman. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I guess you've shattered any illusions I may have had, Minister, that a question might get a satisfactory answer. But nonetheless, I will persist. Um, as you would be aware, Land 400 is a vitally important project. Uh, it, Chief of Army, in a speech recently, described how we conceptualise Air Force with planes, Navy with warships, and so too must we conceptualise Army with uh, armoured vehicles. As you would be aware, uh, Land 400 was one of the flagship projects uh, in the previous DCP, a $10 billion plus program aimed to achieve some 1,100 vehicles. As you would also be aware, uh, the Bradley is now um, close to, if not at, obsolescence, uh, and the ASLAV has its own deficiencies in terms of contemporary IED threats. So there is uh, a significant requirement 
for Army. In addition, of course, in new generation armoured vehicles are an important part of the digitisation of our brigades uh, more generally. In terms of Land 400, uh, there has been significant interest from various quarters in Australia about how Australian defence industries might play a role in Land 400. As you, would, as you would well and truly comprehend, having in recent months thrown the Australian car industry overboard uh, and abandoned it merrily to its fate, um, there are now significant automotive uh, uh, workforces in the northern suburbs of Adelaide uh, and in Geelong, spring to mind, um, who are looking to see whether Land 400 might provide them with opportunities going forward. You, of course, must be aware of the fact that the City of Geelong has run quite a robust campaign uh, promoting its virtues as a destination for investment in Land 400. The, curiously enough, the Ford plant in Geelong was originally built to construct tanks in World War II, uh, so you might say it has a history. Uh, but of course, it has the, it, it's a city that is, it's, it has the capabilities in terms of space, factory facilities and workforce, and no doubt Adelaide makes the same claim. So, in that context, could you please advise us as to the current timeline for Land 400? Could you uh, tell us when we can expect to see first past approval? Um, has the scope and capability requirements for Land 400 been varied uh, since uh, this matter was previously reported? Can you tell us how many vehicles you are now proposing uh, to acquire under Land 400? Does it continue to be 1,100 vehicles or has that number been decreased? Um, can you also tell us uh, whether you are envisaging uh, that Land 400 will acquire a vehicle able to carry, say, 11 persons, or are you imagining a vehicle uh, that is of less capability than that? Uh, perhaps you can also tell us how um, our traditional partners, and in particular the United States uh, and the United Kingdom, might be in a position to collaborate with us uh, in searching for a fifth generation armoured vehicle. Uh, so these are obviously critically important questions. It's obviously a, a question close to the heart of Army. Um, and in the aftermath of the government's recent announcement regarding the acquisition of the F-35s, and how can we forget that delightful moment when the Prime Minister climbed around a giant model F-35 uh, while across the road Mr Hockey was giving a speech about the end of the age of entitlement, a remarkable set of optics which I'm sure, Stuart, you are far too sensible to have uh, advised them to have engaged in. Um, uh, can you please, Minister, certainly. Very good. Um, so, Land 400, what can you tell us about the scope? What can you tell us about the numbers of vehicles? What can you tell us about when it goes to first pass approval? I call the Minister. Can I thank the Shadow Minister for his question. We're all aware, of course, Land 400 will deliver a land combat vehicle system capable of, of close mounted combat operations with a deployed force. If we think back to our combat operations post Vietnam, there are only two where we have not sent an armoured fighting vehicle of some sort, and that, of course, is Op Belisi, uh, in Bougainville and, of course, Ramsey in the Solomon Islands. Every other operational deployment we have done, we have sent either CAV or infantry fighting vehicle support. So the Land 400 will deliver that close vehicle system. It will include a wheeled reconnaissance vehicle to replace the ASLAB. It will include a tracked light infantry vehicle to replace the current 1113 albeit upgraded, uh, but still of Vietnam vintage. Uh, that, of course, will be able to lift a combat element of a battalion. It will have a track manoeuvre support vehicle that enables uh, battlefield groups to cross obstacles, bridging, mine clearing and, of course, an integrated training system. Shadow Minister is right. It's a substantial project. The biggest one Army will actually deliver of some $10 billion. It will go to first pass this year, uh, of which from first pass we will ensure uh, that over the coming years the capability is procured so that when the end of the life, especially of the, uh, the ASLAV, which is the first vehicle in our infantry fighting vehicle, when the end of life of ASLAV is reached, we will have the new vehicle and there will be no operational gaps in there. As we know, of course, the 113 upgrade program only finished in the last few years and its extended life will go through for many, many years yet. It is a substantial project, 
and we are looking for industry to deliver as many innovative solutions as they possibly can. Uh, industry, of course, has been briefed, most notably by myself, uh, on various occasions, the Land Environment Working Group in Canberra on 11th of November, in Geelong on the 7th of March, and of course recently in Adelaide, South Australia, on the 29th of April. Each time I've made it very clear that when the rubber hits the road in terms of tender, we are looking, we the government are looking for industry to provide innovative solutions to deliver a fifth generation combat vehicle type. It must be a vehicle in manoeuvre forces with a First World Army right now. We are not going to design a new vehicle. It will be military off the shelf in design. We all need to reach out and touch it. It doesn't mean we can't uh, develop it in Australia in terms of build, but we need to be able to reach out and touch and see that vehicle. We'll need to be able to see how the battle management system is integrated, the current Elbert battle management system under Land 75 as part of that. Industry needs to be innovative in its approach. It needs to give the government half a chance to maximise the work that we do in Australia. But it's going to come down to Australian industry to ensure they put forward bids that maximise their opportunity. It's going to require some innovation. And already I've had discussions with local councils, with state governments and with a range of primes to ensure that message of taking an innovative approach is well and truly there. Can I conclude, though, by just looking at a bit of history of vehicles, because it's a little instructive? Land 121 Phase 4, which is currently looking at the manufactured and supported in Australia option from Talus, which is the Hawkeye vehicle. I remember being here on the other side of the chamber questioning then Minister, Minister, why did you give $40 million to the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, the JLTV US program in developing Land 121 Phase 4? but you gave nothing to local industry. Why did you prejudice against local industry? And of course, they had no answer. We pushed them in the end. They gave an amount, I think around 19 million, I might be off one or two, to local industry. And where are we now? Those $40 million to fund the vehicle variants under JLTV are no longer being looked at by the US. None of them are. The money that we pushed the then government to use was then used in part by Tullis to produce Hawkeye, which is now the manufactured and supported in Australia option. I'm taking credit wrong. The government is simply taking credit in opposition for forcing the wretched Labor government to stop throwing money outside the country and to support Australia. Another one, Land 121 Phase 3, trucks. Sophisticated. Trucks are not simple anymore, but 18 months to get a contract going for trucks. 18 months. Let's not be lectured on vehicles by the Labor Party. I call the member for Eden Monero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Eden Monero is a rural seat. It's uh, well known as a rural seat, but actually it is also a major defence seat. I've got some 2,000 uh, defence-related, more than 2,000 defence-related workers who live in my seat. Um, I've also got some 3,500 veterans who live in the seat, and when you add together those people and their dependents, and uh, relatives, then you find that it's quite a significant part of the population of Eden Monero. Indeed, in Eden Monero, we also have HQ Jock, Headquarters Joint Operations Command, um, a vital cog in the infrastructure of the bureaucratic infrastructure and, and uh, operational infrastructure of defence for this country. I've also got in the electorate the Port of Eden um, ammunitioning wharf which I'll um, come back to in a second. Minister, um, there's a, um, a couple of questions I just want to raise with you while I've got the opportunity. One is that um, I well remember that in the, in the lead up to the 2007 election, our opponents promised that they would change the indexation formula for Defence Force retirement benefits and Defence Force retirement and death benefits. Um, that never happened. That never happened. It never happened during the course of the six years of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government. And um, about three weeks, uh, th and, and three weeks before the election campaign started, um, the then uh, junior minister for defence hopped up in Queanbeyan and stated that, um, again, promised again that they would implement that policy, a policy they'd never implemented in six long years of government. Um, I'd like to ask you in, in so my first question will be related to that. 
what are we doing with respect to that indexation promise? And is it in the, and is it, so you're so opposing you're it, are you? Again. You're opposing it. Again, so you promised it the last election and you're opposing it. That's just amazing. So um, there is a promise from Labor in 07. There was a promise in 2010 from the member for Eden Monero. There was a promise in 2013. Has it been delivered in this budget? My second issue is that the, um, the, uh, it is well known, it is very well known that, as you said in your introductory remarks, Minister, that $25 billion was cut out of defence. It is well known also, although they were, they've got the um, discretion not to go and give it in a press conference, that our US allies have been very, very concerned about that. They have been very, very concerned. We know, mate. Absolutely, we know. They have been very concerned, and with respect to the pivot to Asia, the respect to the pivot of Asia, to Asia, the U.S. has been very concerned about the last government, the Rudd Gillard Rudd government's cut of $25 billion to forward estimates for defence expenditure. Could the minister t give us an update on the views of the U.S. our U.S. ally about the reversal? of those cuts to the defence budget. And lastly, could I, you mentioned in your, present, your initial presentation, Minister, about the Labor promise to move Fleet Beast Base East from Garden Island to Brisbane. No, no, it was their policy. The Prime Minister at the time announced it. And the fact is that um, they never satisfactorily explained what would happen to the Port of Eden ammunitioning wharf if, if Fleet Based East was moved so f 1,000 kilometres north, it would, it would leave the electorate of Eden Monero, it would move up the coast, somewhere probably to Queensland. Sure and I just wonder if you had a comment about that with respect to the Defence Budget Minister. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Minister. <laughs> thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Let me thank the member for Eden Monero for his questions and his long support and advocacy for his veteran community. He's someone who stands up for his community very strongly and is very loud, very clear and a cogent voice, and someone whose advice and counsel I take and re receive quite regularly. First of all, in terms of DFRDB, and I thank you for his advocacy. We talked to the last election a very strong DFRDB policy. It was supported very strongly by those here on this side of the House. Member for Bass, Member for Brisbane is here, Member for Ryan is here, and of course Member for Eden Monero, who were vociferous in their support for it. You see, Labor in 2007, their 2007 election document said a Rudd Labor government will maintain a generous military superannuation system in recognition of the importance of the ADF. Then what did they do? Nothing. They put in place the Matthews Review, uh, which was decided or which was entailed to ensure that the full indexation of DFRDB did not occur. And that's what they held on to. Uh, three times in this House we put up private members' bills and other bills to try and successfully get it through. Every time, member for Batman, opposite, member for Werriba, Werriba, opposite, voted against it. Voted against it. Had a chance to step up, voted against it. Well, we took it to the election again. I remember standing there with many of my colleagues here. We took it to the election again and had an overwhelming endorsement. We then legislated through the House. Many of those around here spoke of it and spoke well. It went through the Senate. In that vote, of course, it passed the House of Representatives and the Senate. And as a result, in 13 days, when it takes effect on 1 July, 57,000 DFRDB and DFRB superannuals will be better off. That includes 813 retired Defence Force members in the member for Eden Monero's electorate. 813 retired Defence Force members you stood up for and achieve that indexation. This is an initiative that is a long time coming, and I'm pleased to report the budget fulfils the financial requirements of the government. We have put the welfare of our people and their families first, alongside free ADF health care, alongside uh, bringing back things like the ADF gap year and other programs. We're putting our people first. The coalition's policy applies to those aged 55 and over and takes indexation uh, in line with CPI, PBLCI and Matawi. Contrast this to what Labor did in the election. Under pressure, uh, the former member for Eden Monero, under pressure, 
ran out there and said, oh, we need a policy too, and we'll make it apply for about aid 60. Wasn't as good. Nowhere near it. It wasn't fair. It was unfair indexation, and it was in response to some bad polling. Well, this side, the member for Eden Monero, member for Ryan, member for Bath, member for Brisbane, we all stood up for a policy on principle. The Labor Party got a shock from polling and thought they'd rush something through. Their rushed veterans policy for DFRDB sits alongside Let's Move Fleet Based East as one of the great thought bubbles. Member for Eden Monero also asks about the experience from a major alliance partner, the United States, in terms of what was their view of the Defence Force being used as an ATM. And their view came through very, very strongly. Let me quote John Kerrin again, the Australian Financial Review, 25th of May 2012. The nation's top defence analysts warned that the Gillard government's deep cuts are threatening the future of the United States alliance and Australia's status as a middle power. Senior executive after senior executive, from Kurt Campbell through to former defence secretaries, came out and publicly harangued the government for what they did. Publicly and privately, I should say. Harangued them for what they did. Put the alliance second, because if you steal from Peter to pay Paul, Labor's view was Paul would vote for you. And that was the problem. The welfare budget went through the roof, whilst defence was cut and cut and cut again to meet Labor's misguided priorities. Well, we won't do that as a government. We will stand up for what is right. We will be consistent. We will be disciplined. We'll have a structured planning process, a structured force structure review, a budgetary process that connects to that, and we will have a defence force our nation can be proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Call the member for Batman. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Minister, uh, you've spoken uh, with great enthusiasm about the budget. Uh, so let me turn your attentions. Let me turn your attentions to the DSTO. Uh, as you would no doubt be aware, one of the nasty little surprises from a government that promised no surprises uh, was significant cuts to the DSTO. The DSTO, of course, is an organisation that has an extraordinary record and does this country very proud indeed. The DSTO has worked with partners across defence industries uh, and indeed worked very successfully with organisations right around the world. It, DSTO teams travel to all parts of the globe and work side by side with ADF teams and operations so that they can deliver the very best results to our people. And the DSTO is the proud uh, parent of some extraordinary inventions. Our JORN um, over the horizon radar system is one. Uh, the Nulka anti-ship decoy system is another, a decoy system which is now found on every US Navy vessel as well as our own. And perhaps a little topically, um, it, the DSTO invented the black box, which of course is used to trace aircraft. An extraordinary record of achievement uh, in the defence science space that has helped make defence scientists and technicians uh, leaders in the world in terms of how they collaborate with private industry and in terms of the work and their, and their accomplishments uh, to which they can lay claim. In that context, can the minister please explain how it is over the Ford estimates that some $50 million has been carved out of the DSTO budget? Can you please advise how that $50 million cut over the Ford estimates is going to impact on the work of DSTO? Uh, what's that going to mean for the participation of the DSTO in overseas collaborations? What's that going to mean for the DSTO in terms of programs and research that's presently underway? How is it, amidst all of your um, uh, flummery around the defence budget, that such critically important capabilities that flow from the work of the DSTO um, can be ignored? Are we going to see, Minister, uh, that uh, significant job losses, staff losses, and what about facilities? Obviously, the DSTO works very successfully out of a number of facilities. Are any of those slated for your rather dramatic and inflated plans regarding uh, the releasing defence estate? Uh, and I guess while we're on the subject of the DSTO, you will have noticed 
um, that our legendary commission of audit, a commission of audit that uh, conducted its work in great secrecy and wasn't able to release its findings before the by-election and wasn't able to release its findings before the Tasmanian state election, then wasn't able to release its findings before the Western Australian Senate re-election, and now, of course, finally did release its findings. And we found a little gem in there, which I'm sure didn't escape your notice, a little gem in there that the DSTO is an, is an agency that is well suited for outsourcing and sale. What can you tell us about government intentions with that rather extraordinary idea? I call the minister. Uh, let me thank the shadow minister for his question. I am extraordinarily happy to speak about the DSDO. And let me be clear about cuts to DSDO and where they fall, and let's look at this factually. Because unfortunately, former parliamentary secretary for defence in the last government, you have been found out. Despite promising an extra $138 million for DSTO at the 2010 election, that was Labor's promise, between 2011-12 and 2012-13, in the PBS, Labor cut the DSTO budget by $22.2 million. Fact. fact. That, that's the Labor legacy fact. In the PBS again, Labor ripped an additional $22 million from DSTO in the 13-14 budget. Fact. And in its last year in office, Labor ripped $106 million from DSTO, as we discovered in the additional estimates released in October 13. So I'm happy to talk about cuts, because the last three cuts to DSTO have come from the previous Labor government. It's because of Labor's successive cuts that DSTO has been forced to reduce its staff to balance its books. That is Labor's legacy. They are the facts and they are not disputed. This is another example of the mess that's been left. So any suggestion these cuts belong to this government is farcical. Let me also take the opportunity, as I see the member for Canberra here, that those responsible in the last Labor government cut 14,500 APS jobs in your time in office. That is a statement of Fact: 2,800 defence APS cuts over the last three years. That is a fact. And to the member who asked the question, uh, you were the parliamentary secretary for defence, sir. This happened on your watch. Your silence was acquiescence. This is what you did to the DSDO. I call the member for Ryan. Uh, actually, before I do give the, the call to you, can I remind the members that at 6 p.m. tonight, the Federation Chamber will consider the Veterans Affairs segment of the defence portfolio. So, the member Thank for you, Ryan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My questions to the minister. Minister, all members of parliament were recently invited to experience what it would be like to fly, uh, to fly one of the new Joint uh, Strike Fighter 35s. And uh, it was quite amazing for those who took up the offer. Um, I'm told by pilots uh, in the veteran community uh, that it's like flying a computer desk to how they used to fly planes. Uh, but I think every one of us who availed ourselves of that opportunity um, understood just the amazing capability that it has. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on why that is the best choice and the right choice and, uh, and the benefits to uh, the flow on benefits to Australian industry. Call the minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Let me thank the member for Ryan for her very good and insightful question. The Joint Strike Fighter, the Lightning II, is the most advanced fifth generation fighter the world has ever seen. Uh, in working with our other nine partners across the world, uh, ten nations will be taking delivery of this aircraft, somewhere around three and a half thousand planes. It goes up and down as different countries vary their intake of jets. We're not just buying a plane that's an orphan. We're buying, buying into the most sophisticated platform available for an advanced fifth-generation fighter. We are talking seriously significant fighter power in terms of flying computers, if you like. An ability not to be seen but to see a long way out. This is about ensuring our legacy for the future. And it's a legacy based on some sound decisions. The Howard government began this program. When it looked like the program uh, wasn't going to meet its timelines, it made a strategic decision to buy the Super Hornet. Minister of Defence, Honourable Brendan Nelson, made that, vilified and rubbished by the Labor government, can I say? But they made a tough decision, a decision that the Labor government or the past Labor government uh, then acknowledged begrudgingly was indeed the right one to ensure there was no capability gap. 
We have recently made the decision to buy uh, a, a further tranche of fighters, 58, to bring the total number up to 72, completely consistent with our election commitment and election promise. Uh, this is what good alliance partners do and good purveyors of the public purse when it comes to defence. We make a promise and we stick by it. We say to our alliance partners, we will stump up with you in the development of this, and we've done it. Uh, subsequently, Australian companies now have access to a whole range of opportunities to produce uh, supporting gear and bits and pieces for the aircraft. Uh, currently, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work, uh, with extensive work still coming, is available for those with a Joint Strike Fighter program. It's a good decision. It's a sound decision. It will uphold our combat capability in the air for the decades to come, and we as the government are very proud of it. I call the member for Canberra. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm concerned by the uncertainty surrounding the government's approach to its civilian workforce planning. Now, the Minister for Defence has at least finally given up on his claim of only cutting 12, uh, uh, which was originally of just cutting 1,200 jobs, public service jobs, that is, and he's now publicly admitted that he's planning to cut the equivalent of 2,406 full-time APS jobs in the Department of Defence over the forward estimates, and that's just what we know about. The minister has so far been unable to provide any indication of the measures being undertaken to ensure that these cuts do not impact adversely on operational capacity or to indicate in which areas the cuts will fall. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's one thing for him to keep delaying comment until the first principles review has reported, but these matters uh, require assurance and they re require, we need assurance now. So I ask the Assistant Minister, has the government committed at least to maintaining the current levels of staffing in key areas such as intelligence, scientific research and technical work? And how can it in, uh, reassure us that we'll have in place measures to ensure that staffing decisions taken fully incorporate the need to maintain operational capability support provided by civilian staff? Now, also, Madam Deputy Speaker, prior to the election, the coalition said it would cut uh, 12,000 public service jobs through natural attrition. Can the minister assure defence civilian staff that their jobs will be cut through natural attrition? I call the minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Canberra for question. And seriously, it's a bit rich being lectured on this by the member for Canberra. We know that Labor cut and plan to buy stealth 14,500. We know that. The numbers are clear. It was clearly demonstrated on the floor of the House by 14,500. And I didn't hear the member for Canberra out there clanging the bells when Labor was looking at cutting that. Didn't see the member for Canberra on the barricades, did anyone? Never. Labor cut 2,800 in defence alone. 2,800. Did you get a splinter on the barricades, Member for Canberra, when you stood there standing up for your constituents? As I, as I say to the Member for Batman, I say the same thing to you. Silence is acquiescence. You can't be silent when your previous government cut 14,500 and now you're coming up loud and clear that we are actually sticking by our election commitments in terms of further reductions. 2011 12, 1,000 APS were cut from the defence budget. What was your statement in 2011-12? Oh, that's right. Silence. Defence cut another 1,000 APS in 2012-13 budget. Member for Canberra, what was, what was your public statement then? Silence. That's right. In 2013-14 budget, another 800 public servants were cut. Oh, Member for Canberra, what, what was your public statement then? Oh, that's right. Silence. Over three years, the loud roar of silence was absolutely deafening, deafening. And Senator Conroy, Senator Conroy accusing us of cutting 2,080 of personnel. If he'd only read budget paper number two, and I'd refer the member for Canberra to that budget paper, he would note there's only 1,200 APS reductions. Uh, and unlike Labor, we are fully reinvesting those funds into defence. The numbers in the defence budget statements take into account. They take into account measures already imposed by the previous Labor government. We are simply banking your cuts. Wrong the Labor government's cuts. As of the 22nd of May, there were 20,137 full-time, a reduction of 843. 
In 14-15, there'll be a further reduction of 600 from 20,300 uh, full-time employees at the end of 2013-14 to a target of 19,700 full-time, and defence is forecast to be at 18,105 full-time. These reductions are made possible by continuing reforms to our business practice, in particular the wider application of shared services. Reform within defence is being implemented to ensure there are no reductions in critical service standards or capability, especially to defence members deployed on operations. We are being upfront in our responsible reductions, as opposed to the 2,800 that were cut from defence that your silence was deafening. Member for Canberra, member for Batman, member for Richmond, who's just come in, my near neighbour, silence was deafening. Okay. Okay. I have the call. Um, there being no further questions, uh, the Federation Chamber will now consider the Veterans Affairs segment of the Defence Portfolio in accordance with the agreed order of consideration. And um, give the call to the Minister, Assistant Minister. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam. Deputy Speaker, the government's provided $12.3 billion for veterans in the 2014-15 budget, supporting around 310,000 veterans and dependents. It includes $6.7 billion for income support and compensation pensions and $5.5 billion for health services. Recognising the unique nature of military service, the 14-15 budget provides funding to deliver, of course, the government's election commitment to index DFRB and DFRDB military superannuation pensions by movements in the better of the CPI. Uh, the male total average weekly earnings and, of course, the pension and beneficiary living cost index from 1 July for superannuates 55 or over. Secondly, it restores funding to the Building Excellence and Support and Training Program, provide an extra million dollars per year over the forward estimates. This funding was inexplicably cut by the former Labor government. It has been restored by this government. The $7 GP co-payment will not be applicable to Veteran Affairs gold card and white card clients for those conditions covered. Fourthly, veterans eligible to, to access the Veterans Pharmaceutical benefit, re, Reinvestment wrong. The, the Veterans Pharmaceutical Reimbursement Scheme will be reimbursed for out-of-pocket pharmaceutical expenses arising from the one-off increase in the concessional pharmaceutical co-payment of 80 cents an increase to the safety net thereafter. The budget is certainly part of our economic action plan to build a strong, prosperous economy and a safe, secure future. Other measures include Amendments to the backdating the disability pension claim for the disability, paid, disability pension to be paid from the date of claim is lodged for claims received on or after 1 January 15. Backdating provisions for Veteran Entitlement Act war widows. There will be an increase in the number of enhanced compliance program reviews per year from 12,000 to 20,000. These additional reviews are aimed at ensuring clients are receiving the level of income support they're entitled to and will focus on clients who are at high risk of changes to their circumstances. DVA clients who have been in continuous receipt of incapacity payments for 12 months or more under the Safety Rehabilitation and Compensation Act or the Merc of 2004 will undergo a specialist review to confirm if their service-related condition continues to impact their ability to work. Over a two-and-a-half-year period, around 500 clients with a single condition will be reviewed. $6.9 million will be allocated towards a detailed business case and designed for an interpretive centre in France to ensure the sacrifice of Australians on the Western Front during the First World War is appropriately recognised. The health provider free indexation budget initiative between DVA and Department of Health will align indexation arrangements between Medicare and DVA arrangements. These measures will not change the current health care entitlements for gold and white card holders. Defence Service Home Insurance Scheme independent scoping study will consider options for the, manage or the future management and options of the scheme and include advice from industry experts. In addition, other, members, other measures include the repatriation pharmaceutical benefit scheme will include new and amended listings and updates to the Medicare benefit scheme that will flow through to DVA automatically. There will be an annual indexation of the income threshold for Commonwealth Seniors Health Card by the CPI will occur from 20 September 14. And from 1 July, the clean energy supplement will be known as the energy supplement and the payment will no longer be indexed as, frankly, the carbon tax will be removed and will no longer contribute to price pressures. Consistent with the government's pre-election commitment, and contrary, can I say, to the untruths peddled by the Labor opposition, no pensions will be cut in the budget. Yeah, yeah. It's a very strong message, a very clear message. 
No budgets wrong. No pensions will be cut by the budget. From July 17, pensions will be indexed by CPI and will continue to be indexed twice every year, March and September. It's worth recognising that the increase in pensions paid in March this year was an increase due to CPI. Further changes that were legislated to DFRDB and DFRDB military superannuants will continue beyond 2017 will be unaffected by any other changes made to government pension payments. At the last election, the government had a clearly defined policy agenda for veterans and their families. We will be implementing our commitments and we will be keeping faith with our veterans. I'm sorry. I am. Sport for choice. I am. I give the call to the Batman. member for Batman. Thank you very much. Well, our war veterans don't need to read news poll to know that this was a lousy budget. And uh, you have spoken in earlier estimates, uh, earlier uh, session around defence minister about the virtue of not paying Peter, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, so let us stick to that theme, uh, because you have spoken virtuously about the government's uh, policy with respect to DFRDB and the 59,000 persons that it affects. Let's now talk about the 280,000 people, the veterans, the war widows and the orphans who will be hit by this government's new indexation system uh, concerning pension cuts. Uh, as you would be aware, there are now some 280,000 veterans and their families that are going to be hit by this lower rate of pension indexation. 280,000 families, veterans and their families, who of course were given no inkling that this catastrophe was coming down the road because, of course, they've just endured a budget of twisted priorities and a budget of broken promises. Uh, that it is now tragically plain to us um, that uh, there has been a total of some $107 million ripped out of the Department of Veterans Affairs, $107 million ripped out from a Labor's record budget of $12.5 billion in 2013-14, something we can now sadly look back on as a uh, high point for the budget, given the extraordinarily harsh treatment meted out to veterans and their families in this budget. Can you confirm, Minister, that the Coalition has slashed $107 million from the Veterans Affairs budget? Further, can you confirm that the Coalition is to slash some $65.1 million off veterans' pensions by September 2017 by indexing these pensions only to CPI? making a mockery of your earlier remarks concerning DFRDB. The current indexation system sees these pensions increase by the best of three indexation systems. CPI does not on average perform as well as these other indexation systems. That of course is something with which you'd be very familiar given the fact that you've wandered Australia promoting your DFRDB policy. How now can you explain your changed reasoning uh, with respect to this indexation decision? as I say, affecting some 280,000 Australians on veterans' pensions and some 310,350 uh, 310, veterans' pensions payments. The minister. Let me thank the Shadow Minister for his questions. Let me first of all deal with the budget. The Veterans Affairs budget for this government this year was exactly the same as forecast by Labor. Exactly the same. Forget the hyperbole and the hypocrisy of a $107 million cut. It was exactly the same. Secondly, where was Labor's 2013 election policy for veterans? Oh, that's right. They didn't have one. So to come in here and lecture the coalition on veterans' policies when Labor couldn't even be bothered to get off that couch in the drunken stupor and put together a veterans affairs policy is a long, long bow to draw. Let me move on to the next point the member for Batman, the Shadow Minister, raised in terms of indexation, which is hilarious because over the last six long years the government voted down the coalition's legislative attempt to increase support for our veterans, veterans three times. The coalition believed that CPI was an appropriate measure and voted against our moves. And in fact, on the 11th of June 2011, the member for Batman, who was then Senator Feeney, voted against us in the other place. 
Clearly, hypocrisy knows no bounds. In relation to the question, can I say it is misleading to draw a direct comparison between treatment of superannuation schemes and pension schemes? In opposition, the government campaigned to change the method of indexing DFRDB and DFRB superannuation schemes because we were convinced the existing arrangements were unjust. We have delivered on that commitment. We are proud of it. Those changes will not be taken away. But the government's position on military superannuation and pension reform is entirely consistent. Superannuation schemes are limited to a set number of members who make contributions from their salary and are entitled to draw on them. In the case of DFRDB, we're talking about a declining number of eligible members, in most cases with a 20-year service entitlement. Pension schemes are entirely different, including because eligibility is not circum circumscribed in the same way and because uh, recipients do not make any specific contributions. The government's changes to the indexation of pensions are necessary to ensure the pension system remains sustainable in the medium to long term. Age and service pensions will continue to increase twice a year, every March, every September they're going up, and purchasing power will be, will be maintained through indexation of CPI. This change will bring indexation to line for all security payments. But let's have a look for the moment on what those opposite have said about CPI, because now apparently on their trip to Damascus they have had a change. Blinding light. The member, the member for Lingiari, the former Minister for Defence, Personnel and Veteran Affairs, said in this House on the 17th of June that the matter of CPI indexation was reviewed by Matthews in 2008. He came to the view it was an appropriate method of indexation, and you, Shadow Minister, supported him. And I, hear, I, I see Mr Griffin. You, a former Veteran Affairs Minister, and you, you supported. Sit down. The member for Brand. The member. No, sir, I will not. No, sir, I will not. The member for Brand went on to say. The member for, the member for Brand said military superannuation with its CPI link is guaranteed in real terms for life. Guaranteed in real terms for life, he says, and with a benefit paid to a surviving spouse for the term of their life, as it should be. Let's move on to Bob Carr, our favourite author at present, dear old Bob. Bob said on the 27th of June 2012, the Foreign Minister, and of course foreign ministers are not a cigarette papers away from the views of the Prime Minister. That's how close they are. What did Labor's Foreign Minister say? The Australian government accepted the recommendation of an independent review that Australian government civilian military pensions should continue to be indexed by the Consumer Price Index. So you have to give Labor points for seriously being crazy brave. The sheer temerity, the sheer chutzpah, chutzpah, chutzpah for the member of Bass. Chutzpah, which is a wonderful word. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull once explained it, someone killing their parents and then falling on the mercy of the court because they're an orphan. <laughs> That's chutzpah. And you've got to give it to Labor for chutzpah, the sheer temerity that they're now saying CPI is not appropriate, yet they fought six years, voted against our bill three times, and here they are now saying CPI is not appropriate. Remarkable. Simply remarkable. I give the call to the member for Bass. Oh, come on. No, I have the final say. I give the call to the member for Bass. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A, uh, a wise choice. Uh, Minister, as you know, I have a deep interest in veterans' issues, and can I thank you for your support of veterans in Tasmania and that of Minister Ronaldson, and I look forward to your, your forthcoming visit to Bass, where I know that uh, you'll get a wonderful welcome from veterans who are grateful for the changes that we have made, grateful for the changes that we have made when it comes to uh, veterans' policy. I would like to hear what Minister, the Minister has to say. This so government like took a policy to for veterans please. to the last election, and there were four pillars included in that veterans' policy. At the head of it was the recognition of the unique nature of military service, and that, I think, by any measure is readily apparent when you look at the spectrum of conflict that our military has been involved in over the last 20, 30 years. I recall uh, when I first joined the Army, we were very focused on defence of Australia, and with that came the withering of land force capability. But what occurred over the next 20 or so years was an expansion of the sort of things that we asked our defence force to do, which highlights the unique nature of that service. Everything from one end of the military spectrum humanitarian assistance, disaster relief and response to things like 
um, Fukushima, uh, Bandarache, flooding in Oro province, bushfires in Victoria, right through to the other end of the military spectrum, high-intensity military conflict in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And the things that we ask our troops to do across that very broad spectrum are unique indeed. And I, in my view, absolutely appropriate that the unique nature of military service was one of those four pillars. Secondly, the retention of a standalone Department of Veterans Affairs. Thirdly, supporting veterans through adequate ad advocacy and welfare services. And that transition uh, from the department led to a bureaucratic-led um, advocacy and welfare system for our veterans is absolutely vital. And indeed, I hear from veterans in my community that often that's where sometimes uh, we don't do as well as we would like. When people leave the warm, soft, comfortable bosom of the Department of Defence and move to the bureaucratic structures that are then responsible for them. And we have to make sure that that transition is as seamless as it can be and that our veterans are indeed supported as they make that vital transition from uniform through to the Department of Veterans Affairs. And the fourth vital pillar, uh, particularly important uh, from where I sit, is tackling mental health challenges for veterans and their families. And Minister, I'd like to focus on what this budget delivers in terms of the key policy priority of tackling these mental health challenges. I note that much good work has been done, but there is more that can and should be done. And military operations over the last decade or so has resulted in what can only be described as the latest cohort of veterans. Some 72,000 ADF members have been deployed since 1999. And it was with a great sense of pride that I welcomed my daughter back at the end of last year from her second tour of Afghanistan. She is part of that latest cohort of 72,000 ADF members, the only one of my three children to follow me into the military, but one that I'm very proud of and joins that cohort. And I want to make sure that she is looked after into the future should she have needs that arise from her defence service. So, Minister, can you outline new initiatives in the budget that relate to meeting the mental health needs of veterans into the future. And I'm particularly interested to note that eligibility for access to VVCS services has been expanded, including in northern Tasmania, where we have made that available across the north. It was previously centralised in one location, now available at two. But can you explain this change to eligibility and which categories of people are now included who weren't previously? And in the context of improving mental health outcomes, how is DVA working together with the Department of Defence to help ADF personnel make that important transition from full-time military service to their civilian employment? I give the call to the Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Let me thank the member for Bath for his question. Certainly he's acknowledged his distinguished service over more than 30 years. I'm going to say how refreshing it is to have a sensible voice speaking from Tasmania about real issues impacting people. Without wishing to be overly technical, funding for treatment services, as mentioned by the member for Bass, is provided by DVA as set out in a range of legislation, including the Veterans Entitlement Act, Merca and Circa. This means if a treatment service is required, it's funded with no limits placed on the amount that can be spent in any one year. The minister is determined for the Department of Veteran Affairs to continually improve the mental health services it has available, and he is determined to develop new approaches to meeting the mental health needs of veterans. I'd like to share that earlier this year the Minister announced the establishment of the Prime Ministerial Advisory Council with a renewed and particular focus on veterans' mental health issues, particularly those relating to service post-75. It's chaired by Vice Admiral Russ Crane, a man you and I know well, former Chief of Navy. Deputy Chair is Ben Robert Smith, VC, MG. Uh, Mr Ryan Stokes, another key member and continues the Stokes family long and unwavering commitment to the interests of veterans and their families. The new PMAC membership will also comprise experts in mental health matters, representatives of the Defence Force, the community and, of course, industry leaders. DVA will spend around $166 million a year on mental health services for clients, including online mental health information and support, GP services, psychologist and social work services specialist psychiatric services, pharmaceuticals, post-traumatic stress disorders programs, in and outpatient treatment. It's important to stress that this number is demand-driven, it's not capped. It's about need. It's about taking care of our people. DVA has adopted new approaches to communicating with and providing support to these veterans 
by increasingly using a range of online methods, social media uh, and mobile applications. The budget implements a range of initiatives focused on the mental health of our veterans, such as greater access to the VV VVCS uh, for ex-members and their families. Finally, I'm exceptionally pleased to advise the House that uh, the government has recently launched the $5 million transition and wellbeing research program, which is a significant new research program into mental health and wellbeing of contemporary service personnel and veterans. Defence will contribute $1.2 million, Veteran Affairs $3.8 million to this research program announced by the Minister last Wednesday. It's the largest, most comprehensive program of study undertaken in Australia to impact or to understand the impact of military service on the mental, physical and social health of serving and ex-serving personnel and their families who have deployed to our contemporary conflicts. The program has three major study areas, the first two conducted by the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies at the University of Adelaide, the third by the Australian Institute of Family Studies. The first study, Mental Health and Wellbeing Transition Study, will target both serving and ex-serving personnel to determine their mental, physical and social health status. The second study, the Impact of Combat Study, will comprehensively follow up the mental, physical and neurocognitive health of, of those personnel deployed to the MEO between 10 and 2012. The third, Family and Wellbeing Study, will investigate the impact of military, health, military service on the health and wellbeing of the families of serving and ex-serving personnel. As the Minister has said, the government is determined that we won't repeat the mistakes of the past. We are investigating in research ways to better understand the services and support needed by younger veterans and their families. Importantly, this research will not wait years. As each part of the, the project is completed, it will be released. DVA and Defence will work together very, very closely. Improvement of how we work together will be made every time there's an opportunity to make it. Through the combined funding of, the, of this project between DVA and Defence, we'll get a greater understanding of issues in contemporary service and we'll be able to identify strategies to deal with it. Give the call to the member for Bruce. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. And I'll um, probably take a fair chunk of my time because I'm, I'm a bit concerned that I may only get one shot. So I'd like to address a couple of issues to the minister and a bit of the history, if you like, um, which I think has been blatantly misrepresented by um, many people in this chamber. When we go to the question of indexation, we need to understand the history around indexation, which is, let's unpack it. Let's unpack it. Over a number of years, over a number of years, the Howard government, through ministers like Nick Minchin, made it very clear that they were not prepared to change indexation around a number of different payments, particularly in relation to military superannuation and also particularly in terms of veterans' disability pensions. This was an issue which occurred over quite a period of time. In the lead up to the 2007 election, in the lead up to the 2007 election, the Labor opposition committed to changing indexation for veterans disability pensions, and this was in the shadow of the election actually undertaken by the Howard government. Now I might note they made the change in around September of 2007. It was one of the last acts of the Howard government, and now here just after their next election, when they've been elected, at their first available opportunity, they have announced that they are changing that, in, that um, indexation system back. That's the first point. At that election, the Labor Party committed to having a review post the election, which has been known and is known colloquially as the Matthews Review. That was a review into Commonwealth superannuation indexation methodology. You might also remember, Minister, that at the same time, around the same time, there was the Harmer Review into, into social security payments and into, if you like, safety net payments within the system across both social security and also with respect to veterans. In that review, it was made very clear that changes were made to raise payments and also to adjust further the indexation methodology beyond Matawi and also putting in place PBLCI me, Bruce, on the basis. Member for Bruce, a division has been called for. <laughs> Sorry. He <laughs> said. <laughs> okay. Hansard didn't get that. They're shaking their heads. A division has been called for in the House. The proceedings are suspended to enable honourable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the Federation Chamber is resumed at the conclusion of the division or the subsequent divisions.
Oh, really? So what we might do is uh, we might let the member for Bruce maybe finish quickly. If he could do that, would be most appreciative. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. To briefly recap, Matthews was an inquiry into indexation methodology for Commonwealth superannuation. Harmer was an indexation, well, a review of base income support payments, the payments people rely on to survive, the essential payments that are required to give people a chance to have a reasonable living standard. And though that inquiry at that time made it very clear that those payments ought to be indexed to Matawi or CPI or PBLCI. That's the difference. It's a very important difference. They basically date to the same time and they make a very clear point about why you would make a difference. The fact that the government had a commitment to index DFRB and DFRDB is recognised. It was not supported by us when we were in government, as it was not supported by you previously when your party was in government. However, when the legislation came through, we supported it just a few weeks ago. And then in the shadow of that, the government removes that level of what they called and characterised as fair indexation away from everybody else. That's some 280,000 who, who lose access to that fair indexation system at a cost that I believe has been estimated at something like $65.1 billion in the 10 months of the last year of the forward estimates which would equate to something like more than $78 million over a full year at that start, and as we know with these things, would grow exponentially over time if anything like the past history of Matawi versus CPI actually occurs. That's why what the government has done is incredibly unfair. And I would love to hear what the rationale is. But to quote back to the opposition what was said about Commonwealth superannuation, First, with respect to the review that was done by Matthews and to try and suggest that that is the same as base um, income support payments is ridiculous and frankly will not bear consideration and review within the court of public opinion and believe me, Minister, this will be tested in the court of public opinion. And you know how I've had those campaigns and have seen those campaigns run in the past, and you know the sort of impact that will have within the broader veterans community. And so the government really needs to be able to get away from just saying, you said this about something which isn't strictly related the same, and actually get to the question of how do they justify taking so much money of so many in the veterans community, the very people that they said just a matter of weeks ago, that the payments that they were getting ought to be treated as being special, ought to be treated fairly. I call the Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. To conclude, let the record show and let public opinion show Labor promised to indexation defence pensions and failed. They voted against coalition bills three times. The coalition took Jeff. the two elections and delivered it. We delivered on our promise. We implemented and indexed pensions. Labor hid behind its Matthews review. We stood up and were counted. Labor promised to do something and then made a legacy of six years of doing nothing. We stood up for veterans. We indexed pensions appropriately. We made good on our promises, and history will show that in the court of public opinion. The question is that the proposed expenditure for the defence portfolio be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against, the ayes have it.